Well, good morning. Do I have to be up here? This feels a long way from you. Oh, it, it is easier to see, though. I'll stay up here. Good morning. I am Danny. I already had a chance to say good morning to some of you in the class time and before. Uh, this is my wife, Katie. She's waving her hand there. And my two daughters, Eliana and Sophia. Sam has followed, our, Sam, our youngest, is 10. He has followed the crowd of kids somewhere. We trust he's in good hands. Um, we are in Angola, Africa. Um, during the class time, I got to share a little bit more of what's going on in God's mission there on that side of, uh, of the ocean. It's a long way from Angola to here. I will just tell you, those flights get exhausting. Um, during this, this time that uh, we have today, I will share a few more stories and snippets from Angola, but not much, not much, because I would much prefer to spend our time in Scripture. And if you were here during the class time in the morning, you, you will know that our ministry is basically, our passion is helping people to open Scripture, understand what it says, and live it out. It's not so complicated. It's not so complicated. Well, I say that, but the book itself is a bit complicated. If, if anyone has tried to read Jeremiah or, you know, the, there are some things here that are not so easy to understand. But that's okay. That's okay. With time, God takes us where we need to be in our understanding. Today, I would like to take us back to some of the basics. Some of the basics that I think you and I already know, but maybe don't know quite as well as we should know. Uh, but before that, a quick introduction. Uh, so I've already mentioned our family. We have a picture up here. Uh, there's Angola on the map. Um, it's not a country most of us think about unless we happen to live there or support missionaries that live there. Uh, we have built our house there. We live very comfortably. Our house is not finished because I have no time to finish it because ministry keeps me hopping. Uh, there's our vehicle. It, it carts us all over the African interior uh, on very rough roads. Our house serves, it, it's quite spacious. It serves for large ministry gatherings on a, on a um, repeated basis. Uh, we have a lot of, lot of guests that come and stay with us. Uh, other missionaries that live, live distant and, and sometimes need to, need to just crash in a bed. Uh, hospitality is very important. You guys are also very welcome if you want to show up. Um, our two, two main focuses of our ministry, one is the Bible school, where we are teaching people how to read this book and live it out, like I said, and, and introducing them to ministry of all different kinds, Kids, ministry with kids, ministry in healthcare, ministry in evangelism, all different types of ministry that people can get involved in in their service to Christ. Uh, so these are the graduates from 2023. Uh, we had another grad graduating class in 2024, and the work goes on. Uh, I asked you this morning to pray this land that God gave us, and I promise you it was a gift from God. Um, is still empty. Looks about like that. And it's waiting for some buildings. And the buildings are also going to have to come from God. The funding for the building and the energy for, for the buildings. Right now, it's, it's in the blueprint phase and being sent to the architect. Um, but um, we are praying that God will somehow provide the funds to be able to build structures on this land. Our, our prayer phrase is buildings that will help to train generations of Angolans in the word of God. So pray with us for that. Uh, the other main spear point of our ministry is, is work with a local church. This is a, a church that we planted about six or seven years ago. My chronology is always bad. And it's growing. Numerically, you know, it's fairly small. 50, 60 on a, on a Sunday. Um, growth with roots in Scripture we sit back and just smile at the work God is doing. We get to accompany, accompany person after person, finding out, discovering the joys of following Christ, starting to live that out, and then seeing how their life changes. You guys know that the gospel we preach is not just about what happens after you die, right? We know that, right? 
man, it is good. It is good to live in God's kingdom now. But we'll talk more about that. Uh, we get to see that on a personal level. And I wanted to say thank you. I already said thank you this morning. I'd say thank you again to the congregation as a whole and the kids that just ran out. Uh, in May of this year, the kids from Arlington Heights sent a financial con- contribution that in June, the local church plant put to good use to celebrate International Children's Day. We had 100 to 120 kids. No one could even figure out how to count them. They were just everywhere. Uh, there, was no stand- there was no sitting room left for the adults. The, the kids took up the entire auditorium. So the adults were clustered around standing at the back and even hanging out outside the back doors. Uh, as the kids just had a fantastic party uh, full of biblical skits, full of biblical songs, full of biblical memory verses. And the kids taught us that day. It was phenomenal. But made possible by some kids on this side of the ocean at Arlington Heights. So I just wanted to say thank you. Really, we can use... I've got two different versions here. I think that's the NIV on the screen. I've got the ESV here. Katie and I, really my family, can use Paul's language from the beginning of Philippians because it is really true and it's from our hearts. I'll read on the screen. I thank my God every time I remember you. We can just insert here Arlington Heights. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And that's really how we see Arlington Heights. You guys are our partners. We don't show up here often. We don't know you well. We know a few of you better than we know others. But you are our partners. And what's going on in Angola, though you may not be able to follow it in in detail, you're partners in that work. But the focus here is the word in in red, the the word I would like to focus on, your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Uh, He goes on. Well, this is is, uh, when he he writes to the Colossian church, he he has a similarly warm greeting, though uh, Paul didn't actually know the Colossian church. Seems like he hadn't been there yet. He didn't plant the Colossian church. So his language is slightly different. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all of God's people. And then I'm summarizing the verse here. That's because of the true message of the gospel that has come to you. And Paul opens his letters with these warm greetings. He sticks the word gospel in. Well, why? And what does that word gospel even mean? Uh, to finish the Colossians reading, in the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. Whatever this gospel thing is, it's something that you guys heard, understood, embraced. And it's the same gospel that folks in Angola are embracing. And it's bearing fruit. It's bearing fruit all throughout the world. I read these and I'm encouraged. But I also read these and I have that that question. Why stick in the word gospel there? Today, let's get back to the basics. Because in Angola, we're not there to teach people, well, let's put it this way. We're not there to import American church doctrinal debates. We're not there to import our mess and our problems. We're also not there to be the new colonizers to say, hey, we've got it all figured out. You've got to to do it our way. We're there to put the gospel into people's hands and let the gospel bear fruit in their lives. So we've had to get back to the basics. Angola is a churched nation. There are lots of churches. There are lots of churches that don't have many roots in Scripture and therefore don't really know what it means to be church. (laughs) We've had to help the Angolan church get back to the basics, discover the gospel, 
and let it bear fruit. So let's talk about that. We all know gospel is a fancy word that means the good news, right? We're there. If you have lived some of your life in church, I think you've probably got that much. We're talking about the good news. But here's the question. Which good news is the gospel? Well, again, if you've grown up in church, you have an answer. It's the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection, right? Can we, can, we, can we start there? The good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. No surprises up till, till this point. But let me press you a little farther. Why is Jesus' death good news? Why is his resurrection good news? Okay, I get his des- resurrection is definitely good news for him. It's better than staying dead. But why is Jesus' death and resurrection good news? Well, we as modern Christians tend to answer that one way. We tend to answer it because because of Jesus' death and resurrection, I personally can be saved. I'm not going to argue with that. That's really right. It's really biblical. It's true. But I don't think that's how our early Christian brothers and sisters would have answered that question. If we ask the early church, why is Jesus' death and resurrection, I don't think they would say it's because he opened the door for our salvation. I don't think that's what they would call the gospel. So let's hear what the early church actually said. Let's hear how they summarized the gospel. Let's stick, stick with Philippians. I'll open back up to Philippians. A well-known passage in Philippians 2. Open up there in your Bibles uh, to see it in your own translation. That's helpful to see it in a variety of translations. And I've got it here on the screen as well. Philippians 2. The first part of Philippians 2 is encouraging the church to live in unity. And based on following the example of Christ. So we'll, we'll, we'll start our, our reading at the end of verse 5. Uh, Christ Jesus, carrying on in verse 6, who though he was in the form of God, actually let me read on the screen, Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage or something to be grasped. Rather, he made himself nothing, By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. This is Jesus emptying himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So there's Jesus' death. But this early Christian hymn, this is a song they used to sing. This early Christian hymn doesn't stop there. Listen to the therefore. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That, my friends, is one of the early church's summaries of the gospel. This is the good news. Because of Jesus' death, Jesus is now in charge. Did you hear that language? Every knee should bow. We're talking about bowing before a king. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. What does Lord mean? Lord means the one who gets to make the decisions, the one who is in charge. He speaks, we do. Every tongue, every knee, where? in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. We're talking about something cosmic here. Jesus is in charge. And that's the good news. Because when Jesus reigns, when Jesus governs, things go right. 
because Jesus governs well. You might think he had a hand in creating this universe, and therefore he knows how it functions or how it should function. We, on the other hand, make a mess of things. Is that not right? Look at your own life. I'll look at my life, and I could tell you long stories of how I just mess things up. Because I make a useless king. My daughter is laughing at me. <laughs> is it right? Am, am, I, am I speaking the truth? You in your heart know you also make really poor decisions. If you are in charge of your own life, you're a useless governor. But when Jesus in, is in charge, he governs well. It's true on the personal level. It's true on the national level. We're not talking about allegiance to a political party. Recently, all of America is up in arms. You're either blue or you're red. And come election day, either you were celebrating or you were crying. But let's be honest. None of the options govern real, really well. <laughs> America is in a bit of a mess. And it's not true only in America. Angola is a mess. And just about every, well, just about every country we visit, it's a mess. People are just not so good at being in charge. Jesus knows how to govern. The good news is that because of the cross, Jesus is now in charge. We already have some cognitive dissonance here going on. Jesus is ruling. Things go well when Jesus rules, but that's not exactly what we see around us, right? <laughs> well, let's hear, let's hear a few more of these summaries of the gospel. Uh, I've got four for you. This is the first one in Philippians 2. Let's hear uh, this gospel, that Jesus is in charge, uh, from a different perspective in 1 Corinthians 15. So open to 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, he likes that word gospel. This is Paul writing to the, to the Corinthians. And his main point that he, he wants to do some teaching here in 1 Corinthians 15 about the resurrection. So he's going to spend most of the chapter talking about the resurrection, whether the dead are raised or not, because there are a lot of people that have a hard time believing the dead will be raised. Let's start in the beginning of, of the chapter. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, the good news that I preached to you, which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. This is your position. This is where you stake your life. This is all that matters when the rest crumbles. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. This is Paul reminding us. It is possible to start well in the gospel and not end well. Don't be that person. Don't fall. God will hold you up. You just keep on. You keep on. So what is this gospel? Well, he's going to tell us. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That's the start of the gospel story. And it's in past tense. It's what happened 2,000 years ago. From verse 4, he's going to start talking about that resurrection. Jesus was seen by so many people. The resurrection is true. It happened. It's verifiable. And he goes on verse after verse about the resurrection. But we would be mistaken if we thought that he's finished his summary of the gospel. Paul has a little bit more to say about the story that is the gospel, the good news. It starts with the death, burial, and resurrection and continues in verse 23. He's still talking about resurrection here. And he's explaining in verse 23 that each person will be raised in turn. Each one has their own uh, time, first, first of all, it's Christ. Christ, the first fruits, he already was raised. And then when he comes, those who belong to him, church, that's us. That's us. Now listen to the chronology in the future. When he comes, 
Those who belong to Christ will be raised. And then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he, Christ, must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is, you can read it, death. What in the world is Paul talking about? Jesus is going to hand over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all his enemies, including death, the last enemy? Well, let's, let's flesh this out just a bit. What we're talking about is Jesus is king now, but not all the world submits to his authority. You might say the world, the universe, is in a state of civil war. Well, Angola knows something about a civil war. Their civil war lasted for 27 years. Uh, the U.S. Civil War was, what, five or six? I'm not a history teacher. Civil War that, four. My wife says four. Civil War that tears a country apart. Well, the world is in civil war. It's rightful King Jesus. And those who rebel against his authority and say, we don't want you as king. That's the state the world is in right now, which means Jesus is not only reigning, but he is fighting. He is at war. He is in battle with the enemies. In the language of Revelation, I won't take you there right now, but Revelation describes it as God says, I have to destroy those who are destroying the earth. Christ has a lot of, energy, of enemies human and spiritual, that want to destroy this world. And he has got to win the battle, and he will win the battle, but not right now. We live in that, in that interim. The gospel has started, but the gospel story has not finished. Jesus is still fighting for his right to rule this world but when he succeeds, when he comes, when he has destroyed all of those who are destroying the world, when he has destroyed even death, then the world will be at peace. And he will be able to hand, hand the kingdom back to his father and say, Dad, I've done what you asked me to do. The world is right again. If you, like like I get tired of all the fights this world has. Fights with health. Fights with finances. Fights with politics. Fights with neighbors. Fights with your job. Fights with your lack of job. Fights in your personal relationships. Fight with your kids. All these fights. Jesus is tired of them too. And he's doing what it takes to win these battles. Put the pieces of the world back together and rule the world as it should be. That is the good news. That is the gospel that we preach. The good news with Jesus in charge, the world will be at peace. Angola is a country that has quit hoping. War for, for two generations will just crush your hope. And a new generation is, is, is growing up that doesn't really know war, but the world around them isn't really any better. It's still crumbling. And they don't know how to put the pieces together. Our hope is the gospel, the gospel on which you have taken your stand. Do you remember that? The, the, the solid ground in a world of quicksand and swamp. What about Acts 2.38? Not everyone in this, in this room grew up in churches of Christ, I'm guessing. But if you did, you probably know Acts 2.38 by heart. Am I wrong? 
Someone start me off. Acts 2.38. Peter replied, repent and, I think it's here. Ah, there it is. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, that sounds like pretty good news to me. Maybe that's the gospel. No, that's not the gospel. That is our response to the gospel. That is our response to the gospel. Our response is repentance, being baptized in the name of Jesus, receiving pardon from sin, the gift of the Holy Spirit that lets us live in this kingdom that Jesus rules. But let's look at the verses before this. This is our response to the gospel. What is the gospel that comes before this? Well, if you kind of look in your Bible and and, and flip back verse 37 right before this, Everyone that was listening to Peter's sermon, they were pricked in their hearts. They were convicted, right? That's in verse 37. They were convicted at what? Let's look at the verses just before that. I think I've got them here. Verses 34 through 36. This is the end of a long sermon. We're not going to read all of Peter's sermon. We're not going to analyze all of his theology. We're going to look at his conclusion. This is where he concludes his sermon. And he starts... By quoting Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Kind of sounds like that verse we just read in 1 Corinthians 15. Rule until you have conquered all your enemies. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Messiah is just a fancy way to say the promised king of Israel. The conclusion of Peter's great sermon on Pentecost, Jesus is in charge. Jesus is in charge and will remain in charge until he has conquered all those who stand against him. That's the message that pricked the heart of so many thousands. The scripture tells us that about 3,000 people were baptized that day. Let's talk about baptism. What is baptism? Church, we are those who have already bent the knee before King Jesus. One day, every knee will bow. But some of us have chosen to make that now. We have a song. There's a song. I'm just thinking of it now. Kids, help me. Uh, one, one, day every, every, one day every time we'll confess you are Lord. I, I haven't sung this in years. We sing in Portuguese now. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. You guys know that song? Church, that's us. That's us. What is baptism? We have had way too many doctrinal debates about baptism. Whether it's necessary, whether it's not necessary, whether it's part of faith or whether it's opposed to faith. Well, whether it has to be in water, whether sprinkling counts. Church, please, let all that go. Look at Acts and realize that baptism is simply the way God chose for us to kneel before the authority of the Lord Jesus and say publicly before the entire world, Jesus is Lord And from this day on, he is Lord of me too. He rules the cosmos and he rules my life. Baptism is not when you choose Jesus. It's when you kneel before the king and ask him to accept you. Do you understand the difference? If I choose Jesus, that that still leaves me in charge. But that's not the Bible story. That's not the gospel. The gospel is he's in charge. 
I kneel before him and ask him to accept me. And because he's a good king, he does. This is the gospel. But this is going to have some implications for our life, isn't it? Uh, this is Aneta. She was baptized oh, maybe about a year ago in Angola, uh, uh, being baptized there by Celestinu. He's one of our, of our young leaders in the congregation. Aneta, who had grown in faith some, but had never made that commitment to say, Jesus, I belong to you, until this day when she entered the water and she made that irrevocable choice. I am no longer Lord of my own life. I no longer make the decisions for my life. From now on, Jesus makes the decisions. And I'm going to tell you, she lives in a situation that is not easy. Her husband, well, kind of husband, kind of not husband. They're trying to figure it out. They've got some kids together. He is not a Christian. He is not a believer. And he is not necessarily a good person. What does Aneda have to do the morning after she's baptized? How does she start her day? Well, she starts her day even before getting out of bed with a little prayer. Jesus, you're in charge of my life today. What would you like me to do? As I have evangelized, taught, preached in Angola, I've had to figure out how do I boil things back to the basics? And how do I live that in my own life? In my evangelism, I have stopped talking about, principally, all the good that you can get out of following Christ. Boy, it is good to follow Christ. But I start off with, if you want to follow Christ, it means he's Lord and you're not. And then I've had to embody that, live that. I can't preach something I don't live. And so I've taken up this habit, each day asking Jesus, Okay, Lord, I'm yours. What do you want me to do today? And what does that mean? That means, well, first of all, I've got to figure out what kind of things Jesus likes, what he wants me to do. And that pushes me back to Scripture. That means I, I have got to spend time with this book. The parts I understand, the parts I don't understand, but I have got to sift through this. I've got to farm this for all it's worth, for to understand what does my Lord want from me. It means I've got to spend time in prayer, asking, 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 what do you want from me? And then I've got to go throughout my day with my ears pricked. As I go to work today, maybe I'm going to put this in your shoes. Maybe you work at a fast food place. Maybe you work with an oil company. Maybe you work for the government. Maybe you're a teacher. You go to work because you have some vague notion Jesus wants you to work. And if you start reading 1 Thessalonians, you'll realize, yeah, Jesus wants you to work. He wants you to work hard. But on your way to work, well, you've got that colleague who is just really annoying. And so your prayer is, Jesus, what do you want me to do in relationship with that annoying colleague? And you know what? You ask that question enough and Jesus will answer. One way or another, through Scripture or through another mature Christian who speaks into the situation or through a gut feeling that you can't, can't get rid of, and he will tell you what he wants you to do in relation to that person. Well, Jesus, what about my boss who is about the least caring person I know? How do you want me to relate to, to, to my boss? Well, Jesus will tell you. Well, Jesus, what do you want me to do with my kids? Because I get home exhausted and I don't have time to invest in my kids. I don't have energy to... Well, Jesus will tell you what he wants in your relationship with your kids. And Jesus will tell you what he wants in your relationship with your wife or your husband. Jesus will tell you what he wants with your finances. Jesus will tell you what he wants with your time off. And Jesus likes time off. He invented it. I'm going to say God invented it. 
And he will tell you what he wants with your time off. And he will tell you what he wants with your screen time. And he will tell you what he wants in every area of your life. Bringing us back. I said I had four scriptures for you. I think I have one more. But we're starting to realize that this gospel, this good news of Jesus' death and resurrection, continues with the story that Jesus is in charge, and he's in charge now, and the world is divided. Those who have already bent the knee and those who continue in rebellion. If you are one of those who have bent the knee, don't play with that rebellious attitude that the world harbors. Don't linger in that in-between of maybe Jesus is in charge, but maybe I really still like making the the decisions for my life. We read earlier, uh, just before the... The sermon, Matthew 28, the last, Jesus' great commission, sending out his followers. But we started the reading in verse 19. I'm going to tell you, we can't do that. We cannot start reading Matthew 28 in verse 19. Because verse 18 is the gospel and it's the foundation. Very well-known passage, but let's read it and hear it with new eyes. Jesus came to them, them being the disciples, the gathered ones who had already bent the knee before Jesus. Jesus came to his disciples and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. If you study the book of Matthew, you'll realize this is new language. The rest of Matthew didn't have this language. The rest of Matthew had these these, uh, hints and and even clear teachings that Jesus is king of Israel, you know, the Jews, descendants of Abraham. Jesus is the rightful king of Israel, also known as the Messiah. But at the end of the book, after his death and resurrection, he doesn't say, authority has been given me over the nation of Israel. No, no. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I remember as a kid, my dad, some of you know my dad, my my parents. They live in Arkansas now. They used to live in Austin. They were missionaries in South Africa for a long time. That's where I was born. I would listen to my dad preach, and he preached on on this verse. And I remember something he taught me early on in his preaching on this verse. He said... He used to have this way of saying, all authority has been given to Jesus. How much does that leave for you and me? Anyone good at math here? 100%? What's left? How much authority is left for you and me? Nothing. Nothing. Well, maybe just a little bit, right? Jesus, can can I have authority over... Yeah, my, my PlayStation time. I don't even have a PlayStation. We're more a Nintendo Switch kind of family. Can I, ha- can I have authority over my Nintendo Switch time? No. No, you can't. Nintendo Switch can be good if Jesus is in charge. And if Jesus is not in charge, that'll ruin your life. You know, any, Satan can figure out any way to ruin your life. Is marriage good? Well... Only if Jesus is in charge. Otherwise, it'll ruin your life. Is education good? Well, only if Jesus is in charge. Otherwise, it'll ruin your life. All authority has been given to Jesus. That leaves zero for you and me. Let's get this straight. Jesus does not come at this great commission asking us to go. He says, I am in charge now. I make all the decisions, and you are either with me or you're against me. But if you're with me, listen to his next words. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore, go. This is not a suggestion. This is not good life advice. This is a king addressing his subjects. Go. Make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of all nations. What does that mean? Help other people. 
to bend their knee before Jesus, where they live every day trying to live out what Jesus wants. Make disciples of all nations, the U.S., Angola, across the globe, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, now listen to this, if Jesus is in charge, here's our response. Baptism, which is our kneeling before his throne. And the second thing, there's only two, there's two components here of what it means to be a disciple. Baptism and, verse 20, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. For a long time, I had this verse memorized wrong. I thought it said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them everything I have commanded you. But that's not what it says. It doesn't say teaching them everything I've commanded you. It says teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And that's different. If you have been baptized into the death of Christ, if you have submitted your life to the authority of King Jesus, your entire life is verse 20. Your entire life is verse 20. Learn obedience to him in everything. That's what we're doing in Angola. We're just trying to obey King Jesus. We're trying to raise our kids to obey King Jesus in everything. We're trying to teach Angolans to obey King Jesus in everything. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The good news is if we live this life just trying to obey. Jesus does the rest. He does the rest. We are lousy even at obedience, but he can make up for all of that. We can fall and he can pick us back up. We can make a mess of things and he can clean up the pieces. He does the rest. We live in obedience. I'm going to end here with these two faces. I introduced them this morning, Zacharias and Enriquez. You don't have to remember their names. Two young men, both of whom were baptized in submission to the Lord Jesus, have been growing in obedience day after day. The Angolan church that we helped plant is now sending these two as full-time missionaries to plant a new church in the next province over. Uh, they will be sent in early January. You can pray because it's, it's, it's a major challenge for this young little congregation to send out missionaries, and it's a major challenge for these two. But I have faith that the church that they plant will bring honor to God and will grow well because the only gospel they know is the gospel of King Jesus. And the only life they know is the life of learning obedience in everything. May that be our story here at Arlington Heights. May that be the story of Jesus' church all around the world as we pray for him to return. May God bless you. I'm going to leave you here with this back to the basics. Go live the gospel.